If I were to ask you to tell me what it means to be devoted, you probably would answer with something to the effect of this. To be devoted means to dedicate your time, your energy, your focus, your money to something or someone. Yeah, yeah. But devotion, if we're honest, is equally probably more caught than taught or than it is taught. On, devotion is probably best described, in other words, more than it is defined because we know what devotion looks like when we see it. Yes, sir. Yes. It's a devoted parent. It's the stay-at-home mom or dad who gives his or her time and attention on a full-time basis to raise a child or children. Yes, sir. Or it's a working parent who, after clocking in eight to ten hours of a workday, fights through traffic to get to their son or daughter's daycare or school or after school program or to pick them up from practice makes it home gets them uh, their dinner ready they eat dinner maybe even helps them with their homework knowing good and well you don't know how to do the math that they do not nowadays but you're going to give it your best in terms of helping them with their homework then you get them ready for the next day, get them in bed, you go to bed and wake up and you do it all over again. Come on, Come on. Yes, sir. It's a devoted sibling yes, sir. who willingly bends over backwards to keep the family intact or in touch with one another. It's a devoted athlete who does two-a-days, Cheryl, follows a strict no nutrition plan and studies game footage of him or herself or her or his opponent. It's so a devoted single who maximizes their singleness to better their own lives and those of others around them. It's so a devoted spouse who, for better or worse, Come on, Come on. for richer or poor, in sickness and in health, sticks with their husband or wife and puts in the work to make their marriage better. Yes. It's a devoted middle school, high school, or college student who goes to class every day listens intently and studiously to the professor or the teacher, stays out of trouble, obeys the rules and the code of ethics, and turns their work in on time. Yes. And if I had time, I could continue listing examples. A devoted coach, a devoted employee, a devoted entrepreneur, a devoted trainer, a devoted teacher. And if we thought long and hard about it, we could even list characteristics or actions of devotion that correspond with each of them. Yeah. But this message today is not about what a devoted parent, spouse, or student looks like. Come on, bro. Come on, brother. Come on. The passage before us this morning is about what a devoted church Come on, Come on. looks like. Yeah. Come on. Come on. But before we dive in, let's do a brief overview of the context of Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. With Luke, or what Luke ends with in his gospel account, he ends with the gospel according, uh, in his gospel, rather, according to Luke, he ends in his gospel account, he begins with it in his writing in the book of Acts. He begins in the book of Acts with the ascension of Jesus. Yes, yes. Before Jesus ascended and was taken out of their sight by a cloud, he ordered his disciples to return and remain in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, that is the Holy Spirit, would come and rest upon them, indwell them. According to the end of Acts chapter 1, when they came down off the mountain of Olivet and entered that upper room there in Jerusalem, they took to the business of finding a replacement for Judas. Yeah, yeah. After establishing the criteria and paying, praying and casting lots, Matthias was identified and numbered with the 11 apostles. Yes. In chapter 2, the day of Pentecost arrives and the Holy Spirit comes and indwells, fills each believer of Jesus and they begin to speak in other languages, in tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A crowd began to gather at the place where they were located and they gathered because they heard this loud sound of rushing wind. On, when they arrived, they heard these believers speaking about the mighty works of God in their own language. Peter seizes the opportunity 
and begins to preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus to them. And under the conviction of their sin, the people ask Peter and the rest of the apostles in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, brothers, what shall we do? Peter, in essence, responds and says they need to repent. That is, they need to turn from their sin and turn from their rejection of Jesus and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And that once they trusted in Jesus, they were to subsequently be baptized by water as a public declaration of their faith in Jesus and their identification with Jesus. Come on, brother. Come on, come on, come on. As a result of believing in Jesus, they will be forgiven of their sins and will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. About 3,000 people received Peter's message that day. They turned from their sin and trusted Jesus and became a part of the church. This brings us to our selected passage this morning. In verses 42 through 47, Luke gives us a snapshot of the early church in action. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. From his summary description, I believe we can see three marks of a devoted church. Luke At the beginning of verse 42, if you have your Bible still open, look with me there. He makes mention of the apostles' teaching. Do you see it there? Yes, sir. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This teaching of the apostles, notice the definite article and the singular use of the word teaching. It was a body of truth that was passed on to the early church. It was comprised, the apostles' teaching was comprised of the scriptures, what they call the law and the prophets and what we now call the Old Testament. It also included the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the redemptive work of Jesus. That is, his death on the cross for our sins and his bodily resurrection from the dead. This apostle's teaching would later come to also include the New Testament letters or epistles. The early church, Luke says, committed themselves to hearing, receiving, and applying this teaching to their lives. This leads us to the first mark of a devoted church. A devoted church learns and lives according to the Bible. Come on, Doc. Come on, Doc. Mm-hmm. A, growing, a devoted church learns and lives according to on, the Bible. Yes. A devoted church has a growing appetite yes. on, for the word Come of on. God. Come on, man. Come on. A growing or devoted church, rather, as Peter vividly describes it in his first letter, longs for the word of God like newborn infants yes. long for milk. Yes. A church, brothers and sisters, that is devoted, that is spiritually healthy, strong, and vibrant, hear this, is one that frequently dines at the banquet table of God's word. Conversely, hear me, show me a spiritually sick, weak, and lethargic church, and I'll show you one that routinely skips out on eating the meal of God's word. Devoted church has an eagerness to receive the word, examining the scriptures for themselves. They are committed to opening the Bible and reading and studying it for themselves throughout the week and not just on Sunday. You can also know you have come across a devoted church when you see one um, whose members pray for and sit under faithful preaching and teaching of God's word by their local church pastors and other Bible teachers. This is what a devoted church looks like. They learn the Bible. Come on, bro. <laughs> they hunger for the Bible. Yes, yes. They come to church like many of you are here that I'm proud of that, that sits with their Bibles open on their laps to check out to make sure that whoever is standing behind this podium is speaking the word of God faithfully to you. Hunger 
for the word of God. So wow. devoted church learns the word of God. But a devo devoted church not only learns the Bible, they live according to it as well. As James tells us in chapter 1, verse 22 of his letter, we are to be doers of yeah. the word and not hearers only deceiving yeah. ourselves. Yes, sir. Yeah. This command to be doers of the word actually coincides, Tracy, with the mission Jesus gave us to his church in Matthew chapter 28, come verses on, 19 God. through 20. Come on, come on. Jesus says there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To make disciples of Jesus calls for us to engage all people and tell them about the good news of Jesus. Once they trust Jesus, we are then to baptize them after or upon their belief in Jesus. Come on, come on, man. And then the Bible tells us, Jesus told us that then we are to teach them to do what Jesus has commanded. Right. Hear what Jesus said. Teach them to observe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teach them to do. Teach Our them God. to obey all that I have commanded come on, them. Come on. We don't just teach merely for knowledge. Come on, man. We come teach on. for obedience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grace fueled gospel motivated obedience to Jesus. Or like we say it here at Harvest Fellowship, our mission is to lead people to trust and obey Jesus. A church that is devoted, hear me well, a church that is devoted to living according to the Bible will unapologetically call one another to obedience to Jesus. Come on, Come on. Mm -hmm. Unapologetic. We, we are unapologetic about the gospel and we are unapologetic about obedience to Jesus once you come into relationship to Jesus. We do not shrink back Come on, Doc. from telling people, believers, to forgive one another. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. We do not shrink back from telling believers, to, commanding believers according to the scripture to be kind to one another. We do not shrink back from telling believers based on the scriptures that we need to pray for one another and pray for our enemies and so forth and so on. So we ought to teach them to obey yes, Jesus. And watch this. Not only is a devoted church committed to calling one another to obey Jesus, a committed or devoted church does this when we don't obey Jesus, when we persistently, unrepentantly, and egregiously disobey, a devoted church, like their heavenly father, will lovingly discipline us back into order. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. I know that's not yeah. popular these days because we on. just want to come to church and be <coughs> encouraged and on, be on. stimulated and, you know, go in, in a way feeling good all the time. On, and trust me, I, I believe in I'm a hope dealer. I love Jesus. We believe in giving hope. We believe in encouraging people. We believe in people leaving, believers leaving the way, strengthened. There are times, brothers and sisters, when we gather together and we leave, uh, we need to leave convicted. We, we need to leave lovingly rebuked. Come on, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Lovingly called to the carpet yeah. because yeah. Yeah. that's, hear, hear me, let me say it this way. A, a, a church that doesn't discipline you is a church that doesn't really love you. Come on, Doc. Right. You said it. You said I mean, if we're like our Heavenly Father, the scripture tells us our Father disciplines those whom He loves. Oh. And if we are his children in Jesus, we are to follow suit and to follow our heavenly father. When we egregiously, unrepentantly, habitually refuse to turn from sin, the scripture calls us to love on each other by disciplining one another. Yeah, yeah. Not in pride, but in grace and in humility. Luke continues in verse 42 to say that these early believers devoted themselves not only to the apostles teaching, if you track down verse 42, we're still there. 
He says the fellowship. You see it in verse 42? Yeah. This word fellowship speaks to sharing, yeah. having association with, or you may say to do life together, to connect with one another. So here's the second mark of a devoted church. A devoted church is one that cultivates caring relationships with one another. A devoted church cultivates caring relationships with one another. According to verses 42b and 46b, the early church expressed this fellowship in three way, ways in their social context. First, it's right there, verse 42, they broke bread in their homes with joy and sincerity of heart. Secondly, they express this fellowship by praying. Yes. Verse 42, the end of verse 42, praying to and praising God. Verse 47, they prayed to God and they praised God together. And then thirdly, lastly, they express this fellowship according to verse 44 and 45 by giving of their possessions and yeah. their property yeah. And the proceeds of their possessions and property to help those among them were, who were in need as was needed. Yes, sir. Yeah. So they broke bread. That is, they ate together in their homes with joy and sincerity. They prayed to God and praised God together. And then they were, gave money or the proceeds of the sale of their property and possessions to help those among them who were in need as it was needed. Yes, sir. Though the expressions might, might look a bit different in our 21st century context, I want to tell you that the core elements of this fellowship remain. Yes, sir. Yes. Here are the core elements of this fellowship. The core elements are hospitality, intimacy, and generosity. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Those, those, that's what marks a devoted church that has caring or cultivates caring relationships. They'll be hospitable to one another. Yes, sir. Yeah. That means we welcome one another into our lives yeah. for care and accountability. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mutual care and accountability. Yes, sir. We do this in our context here at Harvest by meeting in homes in apartment complexes or in third places like coffee shops. Yeah. We drink together. They had wine in the Bible days. I'm just saying they had wine. So <laughs> we don't make light of that. But the, but to understand that, you know, they, they, they drank together. They they didn't get drunk together. They, they, they drank together. They didn't get drunk together. They drank together. When they did get drunk. It was sin and they got called out on it. All right. Amen. Amen. They, they drank together and they ate together. And how we do that here, you know, we we, we gather together. In smaller groups that we call fellowship groups, we eat together. Oftentimes that doesn't mean a full meal. We do break bread. It may be cookies and <laughs> crackers and cheese one day and right. desserts another day and chitlins another day. I'm just joking. We didn't do chitlins and <laughs> chitlins and, and black eyed peas. But I mean, if somebody brings it, I mean, you know, all foods are clean. Bless the pork. Let's eat Amen. kind of thing. But anyway, so, so. <laughs> We gather together, break bread with one another, to enjoy each other's company, That's it. hospitality. Yeah. And then there's intimacy. We gather together, smaller venues and smaller groups, we pray to God yeah. with one another. Yeah. Yes. We pray to God for one another. Yeah. And then we thank him for his goodness towards us in Jesus. Yes, sir. Not only do we have hospitality, not only should there be intimacy, but there's also generosity. We give away items of clothes to assist one another when we are able and as the need arises, even in cases we may give money away to each other. We give also to our local church. Yes. Yes. And a portion of that is budgeted towards what we call a benevolence fund to help those among us who may need assistance from time to time. And 
And listen, I must say that we desire for much of this to happen naturally or organically among us. Yes, sir. But we know us in terms of people. We, we sometimes need some help. Because yes, yes, certain things don't naturally flow all the time with us. Some of yes, us, sir. you know, some of us are good. We're socialites. We're extroverts. Right? And we never met a stranger in our life. Come on. There are others of us who are introverts. It's like I can do without you and I'll be okay. <laughs> like I love you. I can't spend too much time with you because my, my battery gets drained. Doesn't mean I don't want to be around you, but, you know, I just need some time by myself. And I'm good with a book and a latte, whatever the case is. I'm, I can be by myself. And so we understand that as a church. So we, we want to help one another. So we help facilitate this through, I, like I said, programmatically what we call our fellowship groups. Where we meet three times a month for an hour and a half or to two hours for the purpose of caring for one another and discussing and applying the scriptures to our lives. But there's something here that I want you to see. You, you can't see it immediately, but if you read through the book of Acts, you'll, you'll feel an undercurrent and you'll see and sense it when you read through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is titled in your Bible, the Acts of the Apostles. Right. Yeah. But it could rightly be called or subtitled, if you will, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it highlights his work. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. Not an it, not, an, not a power. He's not a force. He is a person. God, the Spirit. He is working in, among, and through the church to glorify God through making much of Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes. But listen, not only when you read the book of Acts, do you see him empowering the speech of believers to talk about Jesus with courage and boldness, the spirit also engenders their hearts to desire to be around one another. Just read it. I mean, it's, it comes out in the very first two chapters, the, the second chapter, especially that our text. You just see them gathering together. These believers trust in Jesus and they just gather together. But watch it. It's, 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 it's not necessarily. It is organic to some sense. It is organic, pro programmatic to some sense. But but what I want you to see, it's supernatural. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. In a complete sense. Come on, brother. And the reason why they are coming together is because they have a common bond in Jesus yes. Yes. and that they all have received the Holy Spirit, been permanently indwelled with the Holy Spirit yes, upon sir. saving faith in Jesus. And the spirit just woos them together. Come on, huh? come on, come on. They just they supernaturally yeah. begin to come together. If I can say it this way, the fellowship of the spirit produces, promotes, and preserves the fellowship among the saints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, if, if you despise and loathe hanging with the church, Come on, Doc. Mm. it might be because in some ways you are out of step with the spirit. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying that, that you know, we, we occasionally miss. I'm saying that we don't want to hang yeah. around. We don't want to yeah. be at church. We don't want to be around other believers. We would rather stay at home by ourselves. I mean, there, there's a pattern of this. There's a, there's a, there's a trajectory of that. It, I can tell you biblically that, that in that regard, in that area of your life, you are not following the Spirit. Oh, my God. Because the Spirit brings us together. Yeah, yeah. He unites us. He promotes it. He cheers on unity among the saints. Wow. So fellowship of the Spirit. If you have fellowship with the Spirit, if you believe in Jesus, you have fellowship with the Spirit. But if you have intimate, close fellowship with the Spirit, you will have intimate, close relationship with the church. Yes. I, I, I'm, I need to say this, but I want to say it in love. Let me say it kind of directly. Like we, we need to we need to kind of maybe pump our brakes with talking about how filled with the spirit we are. Mm, my God. Yes. 
and how, and how Holy Ghost fire baptized and all that when we don't want to have any dealings with one another. Wow, wow, wow. That's good. Maybe not as filled as you think you are. Yeah. You have a disdain for the church. Wow, wow, wow. That's good. I, I'm, I, listen, I, I know there are cases in which the church can hurt people. The people can get hurt in the church and that may take some time to heal over whatever may have happened in the church. But, but at the end of the day, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. if you are following the spirit come on, brother. Yeah. Come on, come on. and allowing him to control your life, yeah. you will eventually yeah. connect with another local church. church. Yeah. I want to just tell somebody, I know that stop. Don't let whatever happened to you in 2019 come on, doc. Come on. in terms of at whatever church in whatever city and whatever location, come on. don't let that turn you sour against Jesus and his church. Come on, Doc. Because here's the thing. Yes, they hurt you, but you've also hurt other people. It's not like you have a perfect track record of not gossiping and slandering and lying and being dismissive and not loving people in the church. All right, you don't have to say amen, but I'm going to raise my hand for you. None of us are perfect. None of us right. have it all together. On, we are all walking together towards Christ in repentance and obedience to him. Right. So I want to tell you, if, if the Lord leads you to become a part of this church or some other church, please don't come in expecting perfection. Come on, yeah. Doc. Come on. But what you can expect is progression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you can expect is you will see us repenting of sin, falling forward to Jesus you know, in repentance and saying I'm sorry when we hurt each other and asking for forgiveness when we sin against one another. Yes, what no. you can expect is for uh, believers to seek to be humble and wrestling with our pride and laying it down before the cross of Christ. Yeah. Yes. But that's how, hear me, and I, I got to move on, but hear me, that, that's, that's part of how God grows us. Come on, yeah. God, come on. Instead, you, you want to divorce yourself from the church because you don't like church people. Well, my, well if you're a believer, you are church people. On, you are part of the church people. Like you hating on your own people. Come on, you, are, you are a part of us. And if God expressed patience with you, come on, come on. Amen. all of 2019, all of 2019, yeah. all of 2019 yeah. he was patient with you. New Year's, n- New Year's Eve night Come on, Doc. for some of us doing sinful stuff. He was patient with you. Come on. New Year's Day. The Lord, the Lord woke you up to see a New Year and you know good and well. Come on, Doc. You didn't do everything he told you to do. You weren't right. fully obedient. You were still doing right. stuff that you right. know you weren't yeah. supposed to do. And the Lord still was gracious and yeah, kind yeah, to you. Yeah. Still yeah, wanted to, yeah. to have you yeah. in his arms. Still wanted to fellowship with you. Still wanted to call you to himself. Wanted you to confess your sins. Still wanted to hug on you, love on you oh, through, the, through his people. Yeah. Well, if he yeah. does that for you, we need to do that with his people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After all, he is the motivation for why we love one another. Yeah. We are not the standard Come on, Doc. or the impetus for why we love one another. Because yes, if because if I am the reason why you love me, <laughs> you gonna fall out of love with me real quick. <laughs> you gonna fall out. Not just because of sin, but sometimes it's just differences. Yes. Right. So it's not, not always sin. Sometimes we just have deficiencies. We have d- differences. We have different personalities. We come from different backgrounds and something just may rub you the wrong way. Some of y'all they're rubbing. My preaching is rubbing you the wrong way. I'm so animated. And you're like, why is he so animated? And what's what's all that? But you patient with me this morning and you're listening to God's word being preached through me this morning. And I thank you for it. Amen. Right? Amen. We, we all we all. <laughs> are having to love one another and bear with one another because Jesus bears with us and loves us. So the fellowship of the Spirit produces, promotes, and preserves the fellowship among the saints. Here's the third and final mark. I hope this has been helpful. The third and final mark of a devoted church is this. A devoted church, it's real simple, meets together regularly. I know that kind of folds into the previous point, but if you notice in verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts. Do you notice they met together with one mind of purpose? They met together regularly. In this context, in this day, it was day by day. Each and every day, they met together. 
I hear you. Somebody say, ooh, we low, and I don't know if I could have survived that. Meeting with the church every day. <laughs> but you have to understand the social context. Obviously, they were in Jerusalem. It's the first church, early church. This is not necessarily a prototype of how the church should be done today. But what you see is that in its initial phase, the church met in the temple court. They met in the temple court, 3,000 or so of them. But as the Judaizers grew, these Judaizers, people who were connected to Judaism, as Judaizers grew more antagonistic towards the church, the church eventually left meeting in the temple and continued to meet in homes for worship and instruction. And as the gospel spread, the church began corporately assembling together in local house churches on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day was Sunday, right? You see this in Revelation with John that on the Lord's Day, he received this unveiling from the Lord. They met on the Lord's Day because of the fact that Jesus rose on Sunday from the dead. So it became a pattern in the local church to meet on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. Apparently early on, there were believers in Jesus who started to forsake meeting together with the church. The writer of Hebrews commands us to not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but to be marked present so as to encourage one another. Sam Albury, Albury comments here in a recent article he wrote for Desiring God Ministries. He writes, meeting together for worship is vital for every Christian because it is an essential way God encourages us in our faith. God has designed us to need other Christians to help us keep going in the faith. And he's designed them to need our encouragement. So, he writes, continues to write, skipping church deprives in two ways. You of their encouragement and them of yours. Your church needs you to be there and you need your church to be there. Um, I've said this before the harvest, so I'll say it again for those who are new to our worship, to our gathering. What might be occasional should never become habitual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what the scriptures commands us. And we can occasionally miss out on church for a variety of reasons, and God makes exceptions for that. But what is occasional should never become habitual. Because let me say it to you this way. If you habitually skip out on church just out of sheer desire to not go, meaning you have no real good and godly reason to miss. Hear me. You are not only sinning against God. You are being a detriment to your own spiritual health, growth, and stability. Come on, Doc. Come on, brother. And. Wow. Press the gas a little more. Go ahead. You are being selfish towards your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Do you catch it? Because we need you. Come on, now. Come on. And you need us. So for you to habitually forsake, make it a habit to miss church. You know the reasons why you're doing it? They selfish. <laughs> Come on, y'all think about it. I don't want to go right, right, because right, right, right. I don't feel like it. Yeah. Not because I'm sick, not because I got to go to work, not because I have some other obligation that calls me away for this Sunday or for the next two Sundays or whatever. It's just, I want to Netflix and, Netflix and chill. I, I, I had a, hear me, hear me, I had a long week, a long work week, and I need to rest. And there are occasions where we do need that break. But listen, y'all, I, there are many of us, including the, your pastor, for those of you who are Harvest Fellowship, standing up here, I'm, I'm bivocational. I work just like you, 40 hours a week. So I know, and I'm, we raising two kids, and I'm working on my doctorate, and I'm doing all this. Other, so I understand the grind. Yeah. I'm not blo- boasting. I'm just saying I understand the grind. But do you know I have to prepare sermons every week on, in God. addition to me working a full-time job? You, some of y'all can't appreciate that because you don't know how much work goes on, into God. preparing a good meal. Come on, yeah. Yeah, A good meal. Yeah. Get your food, yeah. 
make you burp a little bit. Spirit, right? <laughs> so I'm saying that I understand the grind. Y'all know, I, I just, just allow me some pastoral privilege here to be a little bit transparent. And I don't normally share this. Do, do you know that I probably got maybe three hours of sleep? Because, because this week, my, my daughters, our daughters were out of school. My da- da- daycare shut down. Light, you know, my da- daughter's school is you know, closed for the winter break. So they're home with daddy. Love them to death, but this wasn't no break for me, Cheryl. This wasn't no break at all. I was still on, which I don't mind being on daddy. That's a part of parenting, but there was no break. You know, we go back to school. I go back to work next week. Jesus, somebody pray for me. Come lay hands on me. I need some strength. But, but that meant I'm doing, I'm doing daddy play dates. Uh, Shay, I'm doing daddy play dates all week. Yeah. Spending money, y'all, that I didn't want to spend. Like, where you were going? Skating. We're going to go to ride some of the animals at the mall. You know, those little motorized animals. And then Desiree, like, ooh, can we go here? Go to the movies. Yeah, we can go see Frozen 2 and whoever else next day. She got it all planned. Itinerary all planned out all week. Forget the fact that daddy got to do a dissertation. Forget the whole fact, Katie, that daddy got. But hey, chop, chop it up. Gonna do this with a good smile. This is our parental duty, our privilege. Let's go. Let's have fun. But what that meant was, y'all, that I had to, I had, as always, I have to, I have to inload my sermon preparation. I have to put it to the end of my week. Come on, Doc. Come on. So, so, so all Saturday, while, while some of y'all watching your car, Cleaning your house, right? Going to have some coffee with some friends, maybe some dinner, maybe going to a movie. You know what your pastor doing? I'm in here in the text, scratching my head, praying, <laughs> writing my sermon out all day. Saturday, all, all day. Now, I'm not, I'm not embellishing. You can ask my wife. All day Saturday. All night Saturday. Felt like Jesus. He, you know, not exactly, but you know what I'm saying. All day. All day Saturday. All night Saturday night. Up until... 10 o'clock this morning. And I don't say that again to boast, but what I'm, again, I'm saying is, even if I wasn't preaching, Come on, Doc. Come on. and the members can attest to this, when church is going on and I ain't preaching, you know where I'm at? Right, there, right. right here in the front row. Not because I'm the standard, Come it's on, because Doc. I realize I am a member also of the local church, on, and I need the local church just like you need the local church. I need to be ministered to, I need to be encouraged just like you. Oh, I'm not the standard. I'm a fellow member with you. Yes, I pastor you, but I'm a fellow member with you. Yeah. And that's not just me. We can give the mic to anybody else in the room, and they can tell you how many hours they work a week and all the stuff that they got going on. And some of them come, and they sick in their bodies, and they got pain in their bodies, oh, and they got some real struggles going on. But I'm encouraged to see them every Sunday serving and, and singing and, and, and doing security and setting up the facility. Oh. And know they back hurt. Know they got illnesses in their body. Know they just had a baby. Whatever the, the case is, they are faithful to attend and faithful in their service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yeah. Because they've grown to that point. Yeah. Well, they understand that, that it's, I benefit from being a part of the church, but I don't want to be selfish because I know my church needs me to be present. Yeah. Yeah. How many of y'all ever been to the church and you felt, I mean, you felt like, you felt down. Wow. Fell down in the dumps. You've been complex, you know, perplexed about certain things. You come to the gathering of the saints. And you told yourself, I ain't going to smile. Right, right. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything because I'm tired. And then, they, then somebody greets you at the door. Yeah, yeah. And somebody hands you a donut hole or a coffee. And somebody, they, this worship team stands up and they start to sing. And, yeah, and all yeah, of a sudden yeah. your spirit feels lifted. You feel encouraged. And then somebody sees you and they smile at you and they hug you. And they tell you how good it's to see you. You know, how good it's to see you. They, they thank you for being present. And somebody may even pray for you. Somebody yeah, will give you an encouraging word to say, the Lord just put this on my heart to share with you. And it was that Sunday that you knew you were probably going to toss in the towel. You were probably going to give up. And God strengthen you. Strengthen you. You're going to give up on your marriage. You're going to give up on single. Trying to st- I'm tired of living holy. I don't want to live for Christ no more. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to sow my wide oats. Everybody else doing it. Well, I'm going to party my head. I'm going to I'm I'm throw it all away. Somebody looks at you and they, you don't even know. They just said, hey, man, stay the course. Yeah, stay the course. 
They encourage you. Say, hey, how you doing? They ask you about your relationship with the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Lord uses to snap you back into reality. Come on, God. Come on. Because God does some things, man. He does some things through his people. He serves us and ministers us and strengthens us through his people. Well, let me close this message. I want you to see one other thing. We're finished with the marks of a devoted church. As all of this was going on, among the church, the scripture says in verse 43 that there were God extended his hand to perform wonders and signs through the apostles. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Bible says in verse 43 that the church experienced a sense of awe. Yeah. Said verse 43, and awe came upon every soul. There was a sense of wonder. Yeah. There was a sense of reverential fear. Can I tell you the reason why you may not sense that? Ooh, my God. Mm. It's possible because you di you've divorced yourself from the community of believers. Yes. Wow, wow, wow. Because that sense of awe comes from when they are worshiping God in community with one another and they see all of that. Y'all know how this is. There are times that when you gather together as a church, you start hearing about testimonies. You hear about God sustaining this one and healing this one and providing for this one, right? And strengthening this one and calling this one to repentance. And this one is confessing and this one is being convicted and this one is being encouraged and this one is being strengthened. And you see all this stuff going on and all of a sudden you gain a sense of awe at what God is doing in the life of his people. Do you want to have that sense of awe? Then connect yourself to his local church. Yeah. You'll get that sense of awe. You'll get that sense of wonder because yeah, you'll yeah, hear yeah. it. And not only you'll hear about it, you'll yeah. even experience by God's grace. He'll start doing things in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Through, in and through the local church. Yeah. Man, a sense of awe. Mm -hmm. But lastly, you know, mm -hmm. the last verse yeah, yeah, yeah. says, oh, brother. And the Lord yeah, yeah, yeah. added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Come on, man. Yeah. Come on. Thank you, Lord. It's in the midst of this yeah. compelling community, as one author said, that God used this compelling community, his church. The preaching of the gospel was going forward, and the Lord, watch this, saved people. And then added them. Yeah. That's the order. You got to be saved first. And then the Lord adds you to his church. Yeah. And sometimes people want to be added to the church and they're not saved. That, that's because you can't because you're not a part of the church. Jesus wants to save you and add you to the church. I, I'm, I'm done with the message, but I, I need to extend an invitation before we pray. It's two things that I hope you see in this text that I think the Lord is inviting some of you here today. The first invitation for those of you who need to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. The reason why God has you here, it was not by accident that you came this way. You could, be, you could have been raised in the church mm -hmm. or in the streets not having church or Jesus any place on your mind. You can, you can be an outright pagan lost person, but you can also be lost and be very religious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You can be, as I call it, a church non-Christian. Mm -hmm. You can become a church all your life and just assume you know Jesus because you just learned right. about him, but you have never come to place your trust in him right. personally. You are what the Bible calls or what the Bible would describe as, it doesn't say this, but it's a church non-Christian. It's somebody who is religious, they, they are, they are, they're morally, in their minds, they're morally good, they're not a bad person, but they have yet to turn from sin and trust in Christ. You have yet to do that. And our invitation to you as the body of believers is to say, God, thank God that you're here. Because God is calling for you. He is drawing you to his son that you would come and place your trust in Jesus and you can be forgiven of all your sin today and know that you have eternal life with God forever. And all it takes for you is to, is to, is to place your trust in Christ. Yes. 